All right, good morning, everybody. This is Lancaster Area Woodturners Coffee Hour number 55. Uh, my name is John Kelsey. I'm nominally the host of this. However, today I am going to uh, start a video and then step away. I have medical BS. Uh, and the host duties over to uh, my good friend Doug, who's been a stalwart supporter all along, and uh, my good friend Ernie Conover, who's also been a stalwart supporter all along. And they'll take you through the hour. Uh, we're going to open today, uh, however, with a Wait a minute, before I go to that, let me just say that I will not be here next week either. I'm immersed in medical bullshit. I'll be back on the 13th of May. Uh, so Barry and Doug will be, or Ernie and, and Doug and Barry will be carrying the ball for the next few weeks. Barry's going to do the mailing list. Uh, Doug will do a, do all the things he always does. And uh, Ernie, Ernie and Doug will share the role I normally play. So uh, for today, I'm going to just start. Are you guys okay with uh, with me starting the Barry Bansaw tape? Yep, absolutely. Sounds great. Thank yep. you very much, John. Good luck with your appointments. Thank you. Hang uh, in there, John. Yeah. Barry, Hang has in there. Some... Barry has a new bandsaw, uh, and we made a little video on bandsaw setup, and we have a second one pending a little bit along on, on uh, setting up for resawing. But I'm going to start the very new bandsaw play, and then when it's done, if these guys will kill my share, you'll have your gallery view back, and we'll be ready. You'll be ready to rock and roll, and I'll step off screen. So let me see. First, I have to share my screen. Got it? Got yes. it? Yes, we got it. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Very Thanks, John. Set up his new 17-inch grizzly variable with speed bandsaw in a video shot in Lancaster in April, 2021. I chose this bandsaw over the other 17 inches of the variable speed feature. Um, and it has a separate stage for cutting metals and plastics and such, which run the blade at lower speed. I decided I wanted this because I thought it would cut tool steel. Turns out tool steel is shipped in a hardened condition and it pretty much matches the uh, metal cutting blade on the hardening. So it will not cut tool steel, I'm sorry, high speed steel, you receive it and you can't soften and re each high speed steel. So I can use the lower speeds and finer tooth blades for cutting plastic, aluminum, cast iron, steel. Anything that has a hardness below maybe 55, which is almost every untreated steel. The grizzly that otherwise is identical without variable speed is about the same price as a Laguna, uh, either 17 or 18 inch, and so they should be compared for your likings. 17 inches is the throat, uh, it's the diameter of the wheel, uh, which is true for all band saws, whether it's 14, 17, 18, 21. It's always the diameter of the wheel. This will cover just, uh, will cut just over 12 inches. In my youth, uh, professionally, I've used a 36 inch bandsaw, and it would probably, I don't think we've ever used for it, but could probably cut uh, 25 inches uh, in thickness uh, with a, a two inch wide blade. Uh, this will take up to a one inch wide blade. I have a three quarter inch blade on it right now. Typically, I run a three teeth blade with three teeth per inch. This is uh, also three teeth per inch. Um, if I were to upgrade, I would look at getting one of the newer variable tooth blades that have a, what they call a two slash three or two slash four, which is like it has three teeth that are at three teeth per inch, and then three teeth that are at two teeth per inch, and it goes back and forth. I'm not sure what the advantage is, but I know that when I look at YouTube, everybody praises them as a real improvement in keeping the gullet clear, especially with resawing. Uh, there's a lot of dust made, a lot of chips made from resawing, and the bigger and deeper the gullet, the better it'll clear out and not uh, start feeding it back around to the top wheel and coming down on your work. The variable speed is kind of like uh, these uh, DVI arrays. It's a three-phase motor, but it digitally converts it into a two-phase, so it'll run on a two-phase 220. Uh, when cutting wood, you're cutting wood or metal, 
and metal also applies to plastics. Anything you're, anything you're turning down or cutting down on, you're about 550 feet per minute. 550 is the bottom end of the variable speed. 3600 is the upper end for cutting wood. Uh, 100 feet per minute is the lower end, and around 600 is the upper end. So to change the speed, the belt that currently runs from the large diameter pulley to, to the motor directly, you take that belt off and reroute it to the rear pulley on this there's a pulley behind here. And then it comes with a smaller belt that you run between these two, and that effectively cuts the speed down to about a factor of the It is nice to have this upper port and lower port. The upper port lines up well with the blade. There's a little housing in here, so it sucks off nearly all the dirt. This is probably true for any competing brand. Yeah. It's just nice that they've done this. Yeah. And in operation, uh, the first thing here about getting your shop back for using out here, but the fact that we're coming off with a four inch line, and I looked at uh, what Barbara Frank had, and for $150 some dollars, they sell this portable dust collector. Uh, the bag is not, I think it's just like a cloth, regular cloth bag, and I'm upgrading from Amazon, from Rockler actually, with a three micron bag. But it is not quiet, but it is effective. <laughs> Because the belt just standing here also produces a lot of uh, there's uh, two ports on this one for the disc, one for the belt. So I did a proper touching box there and I have a glass gate that's behind here. I want to increase the suction on the cross. Oh. I'm very happy with. Um, I think they're actually superior to the Carter set. Uh, and everything on the operation, by the way, is operated by the same, I'm not sure if that's five millimeter or six millimeter, I think five millimeters by hex. But you unlock and, and rotate everything. So for lateral guides, you just unlock these two screws. And then the guides are on a can. But just turning it by hand, the blade should not be in contact with, just because it wears the bearings out and it's constant friction source. Uh, but unloaded, the blade should not make contact with any guides. Um, under load, however, slowly rotating it up or down, uh, I prefer up, until it just starts to rotate by contact with the blade. And then you can see it starting to rotate. Back it off just the, the tiniest bit so that it is no longer, you know, just the bearing will sit idle when the blade is not under load. The rear guide, which actually I would set first, the overall assembly for moving the double bearing forward or back for whether you're cutting a uh, an eighth inch blade, a quarter inch blade, three eighths, all the way up to an inch. You slide the, the entire mechanism up okay, here's your rear. This is the bearing up here that rides on the rear of the blade, or just barely makes contact, and then again, under pressure, it will load up and start to rotate. And so we bring it forward. You're just behind where the tooth, the tooth offset, the kerf, starts to begin. And then independently, you can rotate. This lock right here, you can move just the upper bearing by itself, which accommodates uh, the depth of blade. 
And the things on the bottom are complicated to film. Yeah. They are about the, they operate the same way. Uh, for whatever reason, on the bottom, instead of running the rear bearing tangentially, they run it so the bearing is face on. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know why that is. Actually, I've not had to do any tracking. It came from the factory properly tracking. Um, the tracking adjustment is a, a wheel in the back. You unlock it, rotate uh, to tilt the wheel. Yeah. It's a, they call it a fast blade change. A lot of people put them on aftermarket. This thing, you can see over here, we're right now it's just showing this is just some numerical, it doesn't attempt to equate any kind of pounds or anything, but this will change the tension. Right, this one over here runs the guide. We can lock it with the knob back here. The fence came slightly misaligned. Uh, this fence comes with it. And I think that's true for most all the competitors. They supply the extruded aluminum fence for resawing. an upgrade might address this sloppiness that happens when you are like an old cheap table saw fence. When you tighten it down, you are getting three-point tightening, so it repeats square. But when you're moving it, you can't rely on on anything really. You have to, uh, it does have a nice uh, magnifying lens here so you can read the, uh, the magnified by maybe twofold. So you can, you can read it's very useful both for regular sawing when you're using your miter slot, but especially for three sawing so you can cut off consistent slabs. So <clears throat> Ray, uh, do you uh, do you disconnect your dust blower entirely when you're cutting metal? Do I disconnect what Ernie? The blower? Uh, the yeah the dust collector. Um, actually, I hadn't much thought about it. I've only really cut well. I've cut plastic and aluminum, and I have it on for that. Uh, what's the what's the caution on? Having well, it I'm on? always worried when I'm cutting metal with a bandsaw that a spark might go into the dust collector and leave me with a slow burning fire. Oh. So. <laughs> I usually make it a practice to, du to empty the dust collector after I do any, well, either band sawing or sanding that creates any sparks uh, because uh, you can also get sparks at your disc sander just because uh, you uh, uh, create, you touch, the, the belt touches some metal part of the center, sander and it, uh, uh, you know, creates a spark. Yeah, well, I I, uh, I seldom uh, on the face sander on the disc part of that sander. Uh, I almost exclusively cut metal or grind metal on that, and I don't ever turn the vacuum system on for that. Uh, on the belt portion, that's pretty much 100% wood, uh, so I do turn it on for that. Now on the bandsaw, uh, I haven't cut steel or cast iron where it's going to spark aluminum of course doesn't produce any spark uh the right. chips might be hot but i don't think hot enough to ignite anything the aluminum cools off really quickly but it's something to keep in mind and uh, now that you pointed it out whenever i do get around to cutting uh ferrous metal i'll i'll uh i'll make sure i don't turn the blower on or the suction on the uh some of the some of the machines for industry have uh separate uh, you know, dust collection systems, you can get them for Baldor grinders, but the, they cost more than the grinder does, and the grinder isn't cheap to start with. So, <laughs> uh, any other questions uh, uh, for Barry the, about uh, bandsaw setup? 
I have oh, a thank comment you. Uh, about the fence, Barry. Yeah. You uh, you showed the resaw I set up on that fence. Uh, the fences we have here have an extrusion on where you can lay that fence flat on the table and that uh, about three eighth inch wide surface is actually your fence. Uh, does that one, do you have to do that? Uh, no, if you're gonna just use it as a regular, like a rip fence or something, you just don't put the extruded aluminum portion on. Yeah. Uh, it detaches and then you have a, a basic fence. Uh, I think it's about two and a quarter or two inches high. Uh, and it just, uh, the aluminum extrusion part just slides onto it and you, you tighten yeah. the bolt. The scale on the, on the guide, it represents the, with the, uh, the measurement without the extrusion on it. Mm -hmm. And so the, if you're measuring, it's quite accurate for ripping. But when you add the extrusion, you wind up using it as a relative guide, like to cut off an eighth of an inch at a time or something. Yeah. On the video that, that I have for next week, I used the fence laid over on its side uh, so that I could tilt the table. And if, if you have a tall fence and you tilt the table, that fence gets into the blade. So that's the advantage of having a real shallow fence. Anyway, it's just a thought I had on that. The well, uh, Without the uh, without the resaw portion on, uh, if I was going to tilt the table, I'd put the fence on the lower on the outboard side, and so it's tilting away from the blade and doesn't interfere. Yeah. There's two schools of thought on bandsaw setup, and I kind of wonder where you were on this, Barry. Is that one is that you on the initial setup of the saw, once you have the blade tracking, you then move the table so right. that, uh, the, the, the saw cuts square with that setup and you never have to touch the rip fence again. The other is that you vary the rip fence to the blade. Um, which did you do? Okay, well, first, first I, uh, one of the reasons why I have a three quarter wide blade in there is so I could clamp a, uh, a guide stick uh, with a little one inch you know, metal C clamp, I clamped a piece of wood, like an eighth inch thick by 14 inch long piece of poplar that had been straight, clamped it to the blade. So it's like a, it's like a windmill kind of thing, you know, and it's been, I've had a groove cut in it so that the teeth don't interfere and set it off. And so I, using the uh, groove cut in the tabletop for the fence or for the rip guide, you know, for the miter gauge, uh, put a block of wood in there and just measure the distance from the block of wood to this strip of wood guide and make sure that it's parallel. So the blade is tracking parallel to the, the slot gotcha. and then tighten down the table. And then I adjust the, uh, the rip fence to be parallel to the guide because the, the guide is now where I want it and make the rip fence parallel to the guide. And then the final thing is squaring it up, uh, you know, looking head on so that when you, when you resaw your, your resawed piece isn't a, a quarter inch on top and an eighth inch on the bottom, you know, I get it good and parallel. And there's a, just a, a double angle error detector kind of technique with uh, like you might use on a, radial alarm saw or something to uncover whether the blade is running perpendicular to the table and right. hence parallel to the fence. Yeah, yeah. I always check that with a good square when I set up, when I, whenever I put a blade on actually. Very uh, a, Well, very uh, an old time I appreciate that. that was very good and informative video, uh, uh, Barry. And uh, so, so somebody, um, somebody asked a question here. Sorry, John. I started to make a comment, Gerald here. But, um, an old time uh, cabinet maker showed me a kind of a neat trick for setting your, your fence up. Um, if you have a problem with resawing and it doesn't want to track quite right or it wants to <clears throat> move around, he would take his miter gauge and square the miter gauge to the table. And usually the easiest way to do that is to turn it upside down 
and adjust the gauge then against the edge of the table. All right, then flip the, the miter gauge back over, take a piece of stock, couple foot long, whatever, and four or five inches in width and cross cut this, the end off of the piece of wood. Now slide that piece of wood over and to your fence and adjust your fence to the, the, the uh, board that you just cut with the miter gauge. And what that does is that compensates for any variance in the uh, uh, blade itself, whether if it isn't tracking par perfectly parallel to the blade, to the fence. Okay. Well, you know, uh, as, as Doug was indicating, uh, John Kelsey hasn't finished editing it yet, but he, and he wants to shoot some more video, but when he was over at my garage, at my shop, he, uh, he did shoot a video of me going through, I guess it's a, a three-step setup for resawing, and it's a one-time, you, know, you set your bandsaw up one time, and as long as you don't give a severe blow to any of the hardware that knocks it out of square, uh, for the life of the saw, it should, uh, it should be set up. And in the video, I, I resawed some, uh, I think it was 10 inch wide cherry, uh, cut a couple of slices off a piece of 10 inch wide cherry and demonstrated that it, uh, it cuts parallel to the face within uh, probably a 64th of an inch over, uh, over 10 inches. Thanks, Barry. Thank, thank you, Barry, that's great. Uh, Well, let's leave this subject for a while. And uh, we next have uh, Kai Kochi in uh, Bad Nauheim, Germany, of which I was a resident in uh, 1969 and 1970. Uh, and he has a PowerPoint show for us on chuck inserts. Yeah, um, a while ago we talked about chucks and chuck inserts and so um, I think that was in connection with um, turning spheres and I just remember that and wanted to show them to you. So um, the first one is an insert for um, finishing these um, whipping tops. Here you can see one in action and for um, starting the whipping top, it's nice to have a little bit of a hollow on top of the, the um, whipping top. So it should be dished a little bit here. And um, to get this, ah, yeah. um, when I make the, um, the tops on the left-hand side, I have my um, headstock normally holding the, the workpiece in a, in a chuck. And then on the right side, first um, tailstock support. And later on, I take the, the tailstock support away and use a drill for drilling a hole in the, the middle here to insert um, a little um, upholstery nail to um, make um, the tip more wear resistant when you throw it on a hard um, ground surface. Mm. <laughs> OK. So, and then um, I part it off here and that leaves me with a, a more or less straight cut and um, a surface that can be a little bit rough from um, parting off. So what I do is I um, made an insert for my um, four jaw chuck. It's a, a metal engineering chuck, quite a big one for um, this lace. And um, this insert consists of four pieces. First, I turned the insert and then later on, I cut it um, in, into four pieces. Here you can see it again. That's the, the profile of the, the insert. It has got two grooves for these rubber, um, rubber bands um, to hold it together and then on the inside, it has got the, the profile of my um, whipping top. And here you see the, the pieces without the, or the, the insert without the whipping top. The whipping top is placed into here. 
or pushed into there um, that will expand the four pieces a little bit. And then I put it into the metal engineering chuck to clamp it together again. Okay, so maybe I go back. So here you can see it. That's the top inserted into the, the insert. And um, yeah, and now I can, can work the, the top surface, dish it a little bit. And that works pretty well. Kai, how do you ensure that you are, that the face of your top is in the same or in a parallel plane to the face of the jaws? Um, if I get the outside shape of the top right, it fits quite well into um, the um, the inside shape of the um, the insert, and then it is parallel. If it is not, I have to to place the two rest in front of it, and then turn the the chuck and see whether there's any difference, and then okay. maybe adjust a little little bit. Um, but it, it is pretty pretty good, and it doesn't have to be exact to the tens of a millimeter or something like that. It's um, just to um, dish the the top a little bit. So do you just sand it, or do you at that point, or do you use a tool, a scraper, when you're doing the dish? Um, when I'm doing the the dish, I use um, either a scraper or a, a gouge to um, to hollow okay. it a little bit. Yeah. No. Now, Kai, uh, is that chuck that you're using, is it uh, a scroll chuck so that the four jaws work together when you turn the key or are they independent jaws? Yes, it is. It's a, a scroll chuck, I think 160 millimeters. Gotcha. Yeah, and it came with another lace that I bought and I had um, kind of a back plate made for it to fit this um, lace as well. And yeah, that's quite useful for, for clamping big things. Of course, you have to be careful with these um, jaws sticking out quite a bit. Um, and, but if you have um, a hand or uh, a tool rest in front of it and keep your hands behind the tool rest, that's not a problem. Hey, another way to do that, um, very similar, is instead of using the four pieces, uh, I've made a jam chuck like that where you put one kerf in there where you give the wood enough of a, a movement that you can insert your piece and then clamp your your jaws down pretty well. I, I don't know if that you tried something like that, but uh, I know I've done that quite often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's that works good if you don't need much movement in the um, in the insert. Um, with this one, it's as that is is quite a big. Um, round part the um the the jaws have to expand quite a bit okay. when i put it in and this wouldn't work with just one cut but if you have things that are that don't require that much expansion on the insert then it's good to have just one cut that's right you can also make this kind of a check with if you don't own a scroll check by uh mounting uh, a, a good sized piece of wood on a face plate screwing into the end grain, turning it round and then turning about a three degree taper on the outside. And then you drill it or bore it for the inside diameter of what you want to hold. And then you take a back saw and cut a hex across the face of it. In other words, create four different sectors. And then you just pound a ring down over it to set the chuck and it'll actually work pretty well. I've turned hundreds of knobs that way. Yeah, so you compress it from the outside, putting a ring on it. Yeah. Exactly. You can turn a wood ring, but it's it, it you have to faceplate turn it and getting enough strength is a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, you can usually find a metal ring uh, that will do and that works great. <clears throat> yeah. I've also seen inserts that, um, have several cuts from the insert, uh, from the inside or from the middle going towards the, the outside and stopping maybe here. Mm -hmm. So several cuts in there and um, one bigger cut and then you put it into a four jaw chuck as well and compress it and that will hold the, the object as well. So that, but that's just a solution if you need quite a bit of movement when you put in your, um, your 
work piece. Okay, I have got another one um, for making um, jewelry. So I wanted to have this axis here square to the, the lace bed so that I can turn this decoration. And also I wanted to have that at an angle so that this isn't symmetrical, but looks a bit like an eye. So um, yeah, that's the, the thing I wanted to do. But actually I have to admit, that's not my idea or my design. I saw it in a magazine and uh, said, okay, looks nice. Um, I'll try to, to make something like that. Um, so um, the chuck I came, or the insert I came up with looks like this. It's um, a solid piece of um, beech wood and I drilled a hole through it at an angle. And also I made a cut into it and drilled a hole here um, to keep it from splitting down. And then I only put two jaws into my um, Exminster chuck. And now I can put um, my workpiece at uh, an angle. That's the angle that I drilled the hole at into the, um, the insert. And um, here I use some sandpaper to protect the surface. And also you can adjust the thickness of your workpiece to the, um, the insert a little bit as it doesn't have a lot of way for, um, for clamping. So, um, and then I tighten the, the chuck and that clamps it pretty well. And then I can turn the, the, dec the decoration here. <laughs> okay, that's it. Hi, on on that insert, it's slightly tapered towards the top. Is it so that the top, when you clamp it, it, it catches the top first? Um, or is it uh, parallel? Um, it actually is parallel. Maybe it's an idea to have it tapered so that it, it clamps the the top first and not down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, act, I have to check it. Maybe it's a little bit tapered, but um, I, um, I don't think I took this into consideration. I can go later on to my workshop and check and measure it, whether that's tapered. But you're right. If, if I compress it in this area down here where the hole is, um, it cannot compress. So it should be a little bit tapered towards um, the bottom so that the pressure is up here where I want to compress um, yeah. the, the bows halves of the insert. You're right, yeah. Thank you. So something everybody should remember if they use metalworking chucks as Kai has, um, that you should never do anything with the jaws extended more than halfway out of the chuck bat, uh, body because uh, all woodworking chucks have safeties in them, either screws or, or internally that you can't go beyond the hold of the scroll. And uh, it's possible to get number fourth jaw uh, flying if you take it out of the chuck too far. You'd start it up and it'll go ballistic. Uh, it's a common industrial accident. So if you're using a metalworking chuck, just make sure you don't extend those jaws more than halfway out of the chuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I always do. I always pull at chuck uh, at um, jaw number four to make sure that is still um, held by the internal um, screw or what is it? Yeah, scroll, scroll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's a good um, safety thing. Um, always to make sure if you open your chuck quite wide that um, the um, um, number four jaw is is still held securely. Yeah, good thing. <laughs> okay, any other questions here for Kai? That was Auska Seidnit. Uh, very good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was interested in how you made the, uh, how you angled that piece, but I see it was actually done, uh, the, dr the hole was only drilled partway through there. Um, the um, actually, I started off with a, a square piece for the insert. Then I drilled the hole at an at an angle on my drill press, and then I turned it round and made the the cut. Also, I drilled the small hole 
while it while I used the drill press and then I made the 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 cut. So um, it wasn't all done on the lace. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kai, Kai, what is the outside diameter of the jewelry piece that you're making? It appears to be like almost an inch. Um, might be, might be an inch, twenty millimeters. Um, so three quarters of an inch to an inch, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, Kai. Um, you're well, welcome. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, Ted Latrell has a little uh, uh, presentation here on shop, his shop renovation. So without further ado, Ted. Okay, I'll uh, try to uh, share here. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Yes. All right. So uh, as you can see, my shop was a little dark. This was in the basement of my house. And... Um, yeah, I, when I retired, I said, gee, I, I've got to change this around. So I decided to, uh, to redo it. Take that headphone off. Um, so what I did was, uh, I, this is just another picture of the further portion of the shop. Uh, you know, it's concrete floors. It's a dark ceiling because the, the ceiling was insulated. Uh, brown walls made it very difficult to, uh, to see. And that's, that's a shop with the lights on and, and the sun coming in the west. Um, still pretty dark. And that's from the other direction. Uh, tools were, you know, kind of scattered up there. I, I never had time to work on my shop previously because uh, I built the house uh, 40 years ago and, and uh, I was always doing things on the house and never time for the shop. Um, again, I just want to flip through these pictures a little bit. So I, I said, well, you know, when I retired, I said, I'm going to, um, going to sheetrock the walls. So uh, I did that and immediately you can see an improvement in, 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 in light reflection. Uh, the other thing I did was because I knew I was going to be putting machines there. When I, I redid the electrical, I put, uh, the sockets are waist heights and they're every 32 inches. So I never, I never have a tool where I can't have a convenient place to plug it in. <laughs> uh, the other side of the shop that was uh, a six, six feet of this, uh, my ceiling down here is were, were nine feet in, in this room. Um, the, uh, all the walls around the house were four feet of concrete, except the back wall was six feet. So I insulated all of that. Had a little trouble moving the tools around in the process. Uh, got a little further here, just the sheetrock on all sides. And then I said, I was initially going to sheetrock the ceiling, but uh, there's all kinds of uh, heating pipes up there and uh, central vacuum cleaning systems and, and uh, sewer pipes. So I said, I'm gonna do a drop ceiling. I had nine feet, so I had a little bit of room. Um, and I, I made it as tight as I could, which was made it difficult to put the panels in, but it helped a lot. As you can see, there's a dramatic difference when you uh, have a white ceiling and, and light colored walls made a huge difference. Um, I put in a lot of lighting. Uh, I mean, I didn't need this much. My wife said, you know, when you get older, you're not going to be able to see as well. So I put in nine lights instead of six, each one on a different switch. Uh, it's really nice because uh, there's pretty much no shadows on the tools in the shop with, uh, with the lights on. Another angle where I was further back in, you can see the, again, a dramatic change in the shift in the light. And then uh, I decided to, well, uh, the concrete floor I was gonna leave and then I, said, well, I ran across some tiles and said, I think I'll put some tiles down there. And the light reflection was again, a dramatic difference. Uh, that's without the lights on. Um, uh, going back into the other, this, this room is uh, 15 by 40, but it has my house furnace 
the boilers in there. So uh, it takes up some of the space. Uh, it's relatively, relatively small, but it, it works. I started building cabinets um, just to, for storage, stuff like that. Um, that's right for the other end. I started building my uh, tool cabinets on the walls as well. Added some glass doors for that bench. So here you can see my lathe, the backside of it anyways. Um, and um, all the tools in the shop are on wheels, uh, except the lathe, because obviously you don't want that on wheels. But because of the tile floor, um, I put felt pads on the bottom of the lathe and I simply slide it out one side at a time because that's a 600 pound lathe, but it works pretty well. So uh, I just slide it out when I need it. Um, as far as the tool cabinets goes, uh, that was fun project. I did dovetails, which I'd never done before, but each tool cabinet is, um, is set up with tools near for the machine that I'm going to use. So that's obviously my, my lathe cabinets. Um, the other cabinets, uh, they're, they're separated on the wall, but they're designed to work together. So, um, the doors just go in between. They do overlap if I need them more than one open. I won't show you the rest or the details. So again, uh, the other side of the shop, put some moldings in, made some additional uh, roll around tool cabinets. There's tools in there because I'm kind of out of space. Um, that's kind of it as it is today. A uh, lot brighter. I like it a lot. There's uh, the bandsaw that we just saw. That's, that's one that's, that's a 19 inch Grizzly, which I love not variable speed. Oops. So that's, that's the end of the shop uh, pictures. Any questions? How do you keep it so clean? Um, well, uh, let me go back to that last picture there. I, 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 I have to, the, my wife's shop is, um, right next door to this and she's a quilter. There's a whole oh. lot of fabric and stuff in there. So every time I, um, hang on. Every time I finish a project, I vacuum up. My dust collection system is not in here. If you see that pipe right there, that's my vent system. That goes to an outer shed just outside the shop. So it's a dust collection shed. And uh, every time I finish, I just vacuum up. That's the only way. Uh, that's the only way I can do it. So I, I vacuum a lot. My I don't have. Um, you saw the original picture, the the old shop. I had pipes all the way across the ceiling, and um, that works, of course. But in this with this drop ceiling, I didn't want all the pipes in there interfering with the lighting. So this hose is uh, one of those uh, flexible hoses, and I just take it from machine to machine. That, that works pretty well for me. Obviously extra steps, but I'm usually in no hurry. Hmm. Ted, we have the, uh, the same lathe and I've done the same thing you've done. All my machinery is on casters, but the big lathe and I never thought about the felt. Do you have an issue with it wanting to walk or move when you're turning? Um, I do not. Um, I mean, obviously, if I put a large piece on there and I turn it up too far, it'll vibrate. But um, it does not uh, move around any more than it would otherwise. Um, I uh, the reason for that is, you know, usually a concrete floor is not extremely flat. So I spent several days leveling the. Con you you can buy the material to level your concrete floor which I did before I put the tiles down because they're, when you really start to measure a concrete floor, you'll see the variations in it. Um, mm. And I made sure that that floor was flat so that the lathe sits properly. I, I, I did that before I had that lathe, but 
that's one of the reasons it doesn't move around. The um, our power, the Powermatic I have has speed on it, but also that they they sell a a um, little gimbal thing sort of that goes under either end so that you can actually um, put on um, flip it up onto the uh, onto the casters and then when you've moved it into position the casters disengage and it goes back right on the floor have you seen one of those i have not um uh you if you look at the bandsaw you'll see i have that type of thing on there but are you talking about something different for the lathe well, it's specifically one, it's a, a, a set of gimb um, a gimbal, it's a similar type of thing, but instead of four feet, it's only on either end of the lathe, so you have to do one end at a time, and it's attached onto it, um, and, and it's a really heavy duty because it's got to be for lifting up 600 pounds. So, um, where, but, where did uh, you get that? Well, we had, we had it made, actually. Um, Ron, che Ron Sheehan had got it made. Where did you get it made, Ron? Uh, I designed that basically from the Powermatic uh, design pattern, and then I had a weld shop over in New Holland weld it up for me. Do you have drawings had, of it? I had three sets of those made up. Do you uh, have drawings of it still, Ron? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, have... still, I still have the drawings pretty much. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> mind seeing those. That looks, <coughs> the legs of that look very similar to a, to a Jet or a Powermatic. Uh, that that design might work or it might be adaptable to that if you wanted to do that. Uh, well, did you send us a, that I talked about before, uh, I had my lathe on a painted garage floor and it started walking when I, as soon as I put a piece of wood on there, even was reasonably balanced, a slight little vibration, it would walk. So I got some, uh, one of the guys up in the Harrisburg club, I got some of this, what they call the, a coal mine conveyor belt, half inch thick rubber belt. And I cut some uh, like three inch squares. Uh, the Parmatic comes with adjustable uh, feet, th a three eighth stud underneath the, the casting. You level it and, and then set it on these rubber pads. And that thing has never walked since then. Um, I have a, about a foot square piece of that left over. I could cut some pieces and strips for somebody as if they need them. Uh, you can let me know and I can do that. But you can you work you, out a design on the, on the wheels too if you wanted to do that. But you can send us a, 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 a an email with the um, design on it. Yeah. Cool. Send it to John Kelsey or something. We'll put, we'll distribute it to the group. I'd very much like to see that because I mean I slide it out. It's it's you know I mean I can do it, but it's tough to do. Yeah. And I like the idea of the adjustable uh, casters at the bottom. That old shopsmith on the left over there, that, that has a similar setup. The, you lift and lower one side at a time, but they're not adjustable. If you look on uh, Powermatic's website, I think you'll, you'll be able to find that. It's an optional attachment to give an idea of what, the, what it looks like, but I can send my drawings out. Oh, that'd be cool. There's, there's a number, number of companies making these kinds of casters uh, for workbenches, lathes, whatever. Yeah. And they uh, are all pretty heavy duty. Uh, Lee Valley sells uh, a line of them. And I think <clears throat> Affinity Tool in uh, Detroit, who really makes all the mobile bases for machinery that you buy almost anywhere, uh, I believe they have a line of them as well. So uh, it is a nice option if you need to move a machine in and out of a place in a shop where space is limited i've got to agree everything of course here's my space is limited i can't even put any more tools in here <laughs> however my my son and i are designing his shop he lives next door to me and we're going to make a 30 he's making a studio that's going to be 30 by 40 feet the basement area which will be open on one side with doors will be uh, our uh, wood shop for larger tools <laughs> Well, it's, I'm working in a shop just about that size, and it uh, it's not enough space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it never is, but well, he's going to be stuck with 30 by 40. <laughs> I uh, the mutable uh, law of physics is that stuff expands exponentially to fit 
to cover all horizontal surfaces of the shop. That's for sure. And, and, and then it just expands out exponentially afterward to co cover all vertical surfaces as well until you're just doing in a hole. <laughs> Can I get you to stop uh, sharing your screen, Ted? One more thing. Uh, that was my okay. inside shop. This is, I uh, thought I'd show you the picture of my outside shop. Well, huh. I, which I affectionately call the hangar deck. And uh, as you can see, obviously I work on uh, remote control airplanes out here, but I can only do that in the summertime. Yes. That's, that's 24 by 36. So that gives me a little more room. That's the up, upper floor of my garage. <laughs> wow. wow. And <clears throat> somebody will probably ask, so I thought I'd throw it in there. That's the size of the airplanes. Just oh my gosh. <laughs> now, now quit the are they electric or are they uh, uh, run with a gasoline motor? That one's run with a 150 cc twin cylinder gas motor. Oh, wow. uh, most of my stuff is gas. I do electric, but only on the smaller stuff. So huh. there you go. Wow. Well, that's a very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go on to Ray Simmons. Um, and I believe you have a photo uh, to show us of his, what he's going to talk about here, a project he's working on. Doug, I think Doug, you have the pictures. Okay, hey, this is, you know, we were talking about tools and tips uh, over the last couple of weeks. And this is something I've used and I mentioned this to somebody and they laughed, but this is a regular shoe brush. And, you know, the kind of question is, what would you use that for? But I do with ornamental, a lot of the ornamental work I do, when you make a cut, I can't, I can't sand. You can't, you can't take any detail out. And one of the guys I run into a number of years ago said, let me show you something. And he had one of these. And I, I use that not only in ornamental, but regular turning as well. It does a couple of things. If you have a real sharp edge and you buff that, you'll buff that edge off. And we found that if you just use this shoe brush, I can, if, you, if I cut say a groove in a, in a bowl or a, or a box, and you, you know how a, a, a sawdust will, will build up in there or you try to buff it. I use this, I can actually get the sawdust out of those pieces that might be a little bit grainy and or out of a finial, put a little bit to touch of wax on there and just do this by hand. And um, horsehair brushes have been used for a very long time to finish up uh, a lot of wood projects. So uh, I just throw that out. If you haven't tried it and you're doing finials or very, very fine, maybe like a cut, a groove in a box, instead of buffing it, try this. Cost you a couple dollars. Go to next one, Doug. This is uh, a one way makes a, uh, a drill wizard, which tells you to set up and drill precise holes. I want to do some uh, stacked lamination. And, but what I was doing, I had seen some projects that were extremely thick and they're hard to do by hand. So what I did is I modified this drill wizard and um, you know, took it apart, took the part off the holes of drill and used the drill wizard with a parting tool from a metal lathe and then took the holder and, and made a, a, an adapter to hold that. And go to the next one, Doug. And this is another another view. Now that the handle the handle you saw on the top moves this in and out. So once I set the angle up on this and lock this on the lathe, I can cut always at the same angle, which lets me cut some stack laminations very thin. Uh, next one, Doug. Uh, and just a tool cutter. Now what I had, uh, I think last week and week before we talked about um, somebody was cutting out, cutting grooves in uh, a piece and a piece, the, it broke. I found what the problem I had was cutting these that if the cutter touched in the groove, in the, the radius of the groove, I'd have that same problem. So I had to just keep cutting, grinding this back until I could make a cut and have that not touch anywhere in that radius. And it works exceptionally well because the next picture, Doug, this is an inch and a quarter thick, and it's about six inches. And I can cut those circles out for stacked lamination using that, cut very slow, cut some one after another, same angle, 
but it allows me to cut the wall thickness down where I can get, you know, you look at that, I'm getting stacks uh, uh, an inch and a quarter thick. Mm-hmm. So uh, it works extremely well. It was a bit of work to get it, you know, but just take your time. Uh, that's it, Doug, thanks. Hey, Ray, uh, yeah. talking about your brush, have you thought about a, like a shaving brush for your dog to sit in a shaving lather on? Yeah. That work the same for what yeah. you had there. That, that kind of does the same thing, but what happens with being able to hold that is you can get some speed up to it and you can get some pressure on it. So anybody anybody that's ever shined shoes, that's what you use. And that, that's where the idea, you know, I said, well, that's a good idea because I can put pressure on that. And uh, if, you're, if you're doing some fine cuts and you're having, and, and if you're having sawdust problems, sometimes you, the guys have complained about they get sawdust down into the wood. Uh, this will help with that. You can buff that with that and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, knock the sharp corners off. So, there, there are a fair number of people today that are electing to uh, do joinery uh, entirely with hand tools. They don't use any electric power whatsoever to make anything. And one of the ways that they smooth the wood is by burnishing it. And you can actually, there's uh, a gentleman that sells little brooms, if they will. They're made out of broom straws. They're very stiff and they're only about this long, but you can rub those on a piece of wood and it will smooth it like sandpaper. It's quite remarkable how well they work and with less effort than sandpaper. And you're really burnishing the wood. So it, it, it is a way to uh, knock corners off, smooth things. It, it's a very uh, uh, ideal way to do it. Mm. Is that sort of, uh, Ernie, it's sort of like the same idea of taking a handful of shavings to do the last little burnishing of your uh, turning when you're doing it? Identical, yeah. Yeah, identical. Um, Ernie, someone asked about measurements earlier on, and I've I've got them. If you could spotlight me, I can show yep. that again. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you're, you're actually in speaker view right now, so you probably... Okay. Right. So then I just try to hold it in a way that you can see it. So the, the hole is angled. Um, the diameter from here to here, which is the diameter of the, the jewelry pieces, is 18 millimeters. So I drilled an 18 millimeter hole, which is just below three quarters of an inch. Um, so that was one measurement. Then Doug asked about the, the thing being tapered. And there is a taper of about an eighth of an inch between the bottom and the top so that it can compress the top without um, touching the, the bottom as you um, suggested, um, Doug. And <laughs> the total height is a bit less than, um, than two inches. Okay, so that's it. Thank and you here right. you can see that the, the hole is angled. Here you can you see nearly a, a complete circle and then on the other side it's it's less of a circle so the the hole is is angled down here yeah in this in this place mm. maybe better to see it like that yeah Thanks, okay Kai. that's that, it mm. the uh for kai or anybody else a, a useful converter that you can download for your phone is made by felder who makes high-end machinery in Austria. And uh, it uh, uh, has a unit converter that you can set up. I, I have mine to put inches in and it'll read out millimeters. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of FES tools will only work in millimeters. So uh, it's nice to have a quick converter. So it's a free app. Just go to Felder's website. You can download it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we've actually run out of time. We're at one minute past the hour. So uh, it was uh, a great coffee hour today. Uh, we saw some really neat things and uh, it's nice to know that uh, craft is being kept alive in the uh, basement workshops uh, all over the world. And the nice thing about amateurs is that we can do th some things that professionals couldn't afford to do. 
we could do things in ways they couldn't afford to do. And in some ways we are keeping craft alive. So keep up the good work. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for being here today. And uh, if any, if, go ahead. Uh, sorry, and, and if anybody has something they'd like to share next week, um, don't forget to put up your hand or send an email or something to John and he'll forward it to us or whatever. Uh, and we'll make sure we put the list together. Otherwise we'll just, do it next week as we have in the past, which is just we'll put your hand up at the beginning of the show. Okay. Yep. Have a good have a good week and have a good turning. Thank you. Yep. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Hi guys. Yep. So long. Thank you. Take Take care. Care. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey Ernie, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Uh a question I've been meaning to ask you, it's got nothing to do with today's matter, but uh, have you ever seen or heard of anybody using a regular uh, cabinet scraper, you know, a curved cabinet scraper using very low RPM on the inside of a bowl for scraping? I have. Yeah. I've I, actually, I, I've done it. Sure. Yeah, How did it work out? So have I. I've tried it. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. yeah. It, I, it's fair to Midland. Uh, I, I don't see it, it. It does not beat an electric drill with pieces <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I just thought it might be useful for uh, any, you know, minor ridges in the. Uh, yeah. It, it certainly can fare out tool marks, mm -hmm. do things like that without tearing unduly bad. Uh, I, I look at a scraper in cabinet work, at least, to be kind of like a bayonet, that if you can shoot whatever you need to shoot with a rifle, uh, it, it's better. But at some point, you have to resort to a bayonet, and uh, that's what you do. And so a scraper, to me, in cabinet making is kind of a last-ditch tool. Oh, okay. I had some, some planks that I tried to the plane, and I had a devil, devil of a time with them. So I got a scraper on. They did a much better job of the scraper, but it takes a lot that's of a, work. That's a plank. I, I think that the uh, the the three inch diameter um, pad disc sander does a lot better job of taking care of the ridges in the, on the inside of a bowl than the scraper does, or, or one of those, just because you're going across the work instead of along the work. So I, I've had a lot of better luck with the discs with the sanding disc and I have ever had with a scraper of getting rid of the two things you're talking about. Hey, there you go. Yep, there's a French curve scraper. It's fairly yeah. handy that you want to wear a pair of something on your fingers that are durable that you won't cut yourself when you do this. And I find gloves to be a little dangerous around a leg, so I don't wear them. And yes, there's a real necessity for it. And this video went one place, but uh, it will do a pretty nice job and work. Well, I've been able to, to get my round nose scraper on the bottom of a bowl and do a pretty good job at taking the tool mark ridges out. But uh, they can they can grab. I had an awful lot of grabbing when I was learning, but I think I've gotten pretty good at it now. Well, uh, an Ellsworth suicide cut, as he calls it, is a good way to do it. I do it differently. I do it with a very long ground spindle gouge. But with the heel, if this is the inside of the bowl, I do it by bringing that spindle gouge in like this and running it along this and the bevel sitting behind the cut. And you can get down, you can't always get right around the corner, but you can get a large part of that wall cleaned up and ferret out in a way that you have very little sanding left to do. Yeah, yeah. definitely. The, well, then you uh, use a conventional grind bow gouge on the bottom to get around that tight corner, and I do that sometimes. Yeah, you can grind up. They used to sell. You can still buy them around, but they don't call them this anymore. But they used to call it a combination gouge, and that was one with a bit of a deeper flute. It wasn't a bowl gouge. It wasn't a spindle gouge. But you could grind that to about a 45-degree bevel and do some pretty good work with it. Uh, Mario was using one when he was doing the spheres, he was using a, ground, a gouge ground in that way. I, I have a scraper that my wife gave me a long while ago that was sold by Sorby. It's called a bowl scraper, which yeah. is a, a, actually, it's a negative rate scraper, but it's just got a very, it's, it's a, 
a very very shallow round nose on it so it's it's not straight but it's a shallow round nose it's almost the same shape as ernie's the largest uh, angle on ernie's french curve which again it's a scraper it does the same thing as that hand scraper but it tends to be a bowl scraper instead works okay and generally those the bowl scraper is going to be high speed so you get a more durable burr then you yeah. get one of these hard scrapers, which are uh, basically carbon steel hardened to about 45, 50 Rockwell. Well, okay, well, thanks for the answer. Uh, I got rid of my scrapers a long, long time ago. I think about the time that I discovered sandpaper for furniture work. And uh, I was just debating buying a scraper or uh, cutting a piece of sheet stock to give it a try. So I'm glad to hear that somebody else has tried it and the results weren't that great. Well, yeah, hey, Barry, if, if you want, I... Planes have gotten to where you can control the mouth opening so well that you don't, it, you just do not tear out. And you can, you can cut curly maple with these things. They're unbelievable. Well, that's what and I was going to say with, with sandpaper versus, versus scraping on a on a small piece of wood, uh, you can do a wonderful job with a scraper and a really smooth finish when you're done. It's better than most sandpaper. And, and, and if you well, want to borrow a set of scrapers, Barry, I'll lend you a set before you go buy them. <laughs> I got the set in my drawer. I haven't used them for about five years. So, you know, yeah. if you truly want to try it, just, just no, give I, me a I'm shout. I'm curious about if anybody had tried it, what kind of results? Because I just, uh, I have used a... Uh, it's kind of like a one-handed, you know what a squirt is? Yeah. It's like, this is like a, an old three quarter inch or, or half inch bandsaw blade that I cut the teeth off, made it into a loop and oh, yeah. put it in a file handle. And it's been sharpened around the edge and you can, it, it cuts more in a scraping mode than in a digging out mode. I made it for making spoon bowls, but it does work in the lathe pretty well. And your, your hand just shatters with it, you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I guess we've scraped the bottom of this hour. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey guys. <Yeah. laughs> okay. See you again next week. Take okay. care, everybody. Thank, thanks, Ernie and Doug. Did a great job. Look forward to next week. All right. Thank Come you. On. Bye bye. See you next Bye. week.